I'm not going to let you spoil my new attitude. I'm going to celebrate the witch's holiday with enthusiasm. Can you believe that a show about witches running for eight seasons with 22 episodes per year to play with only had two Halloween episodes? And one of them doesn't really count since it just happens to take place on the holiday. So there's only one true Halloween episode of Charmed. Ah, oh, Hallows Eve. A witch's most sacred day. You can thank Mr. Spelling for this, as he wanted to make sure nothing dated the show and all the episodes to appear as though they could take place whenever anyone wanted them to, so people could watch at any time and not be taken out of it. Pretty much everyone in the cast argued that a witch show needed a Halloween episode, and they were at last granted one in season three. Yeah, the only problem is you never really know what you're celebrating when you celebrate Halloween. All Halliwell's Eve sees all three Charmed Ones preparing for a special Halloween shindig at P3, where they've gone all out with the costumes. Piper, as the conservative Kate Jackson figure of the show, has gone with Glinda, the Good Witch. Of the North, if you only go by the MGM film, but of the South, if you know better. And it technically completes the set of all charmed ones being blonde at some point. Phoebe has gone for Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, the first nationally syndicated horror host known for... Well, we'll let one of her film titles sum it up. It was also an incredible pair of legs. Prue isn't cosplaying as anyone, so her costume is said to be a witch of nature. Leo and Daryl are feeling lazy and just wear their rookie uniforms, though Leo's is a tad more impressive. And Cole, who honestly seems like the type to go for Conan the Barbarian, shows up as Leo. So you're an angel. <laughs> While I want to give him the prize for best costume for sheer cheek, Prue easily wins out. But yeah, there is an actual plot. <laughs> The Elders send the sisters back in time to 1670, where a special baby is to be born on All Hallows' Eve, and Cole has travelled back in time to help a dark practitioner called Ruth Cobb raise the child evil. Where do you come from, pray tell? I come from the future. There is also a B-plot involving the Grimlocks from Out of Sight, who get to return from the dead on All Hallows' Eve, though it isn't said if they're back for good or just for the night. They want to get revenge on the Charmed Ones for vanquishing them, but since they're MIA, they have to make do with Leo and Daryl, who also remember that since their MO is targeting children, the fact that it's an evening where young ones are out on the street means they gotta make themselves a potion. Stay here, finish that potion. No matter what happens, you make sure you bring the girls home safe. All Halliwell's Eve is a beloved episode for a good reason, and for once I can't be a contrarian, because I love this one too. I mean, if it's existence and my best friend were hanging off the edge of a cliff and I could only save one, obviously I would save the BFF. But that doesn't mean I don't love the episode itself. How can you not know about All Hallows' Eve? It isn't what it used to be. We saw a brief flashback to the 1600s for season one's The Witch is Back, featuring the execution of Melinda Warren, the start of the Charmed line, but now we get to spend a whole episode here. Supposedly Melinda herself was meant to feature in this one, and the three lead actresses loved Tyler Layton so much after filming The Witches Back that they pretty much said, we want her back as soon as they wrapped. But she never appeared on the show again because of her love for the stage and being constantly committed to that rather than television. I don't know how true the story of Melinda featuring in this episode is, because it seems pretty well written around Ava and her coven, and I don't know how the twist of the end would have played out differently. Melinda? Yes, Melinda. Melinda Warren. Uh so this one seems fine as is. I think we're related. Ava herself is a great character, and I personally like the chance to see that there were witch practitioners before Melinda came along, and the fact that several women were responsible for raising and mentoring her, rather than her just being the chosen one, helps the female empowerment theme considerably. Reminds us of the wisdom and the power of women. We don't get too much insight into the charmed ancestors beyond this and pardon my past, and I suppose a night to remember too, so any chance to delve deeper into the lore is welcome. There is magic all around you especially on this night. Both Melinda and Ava enjoy great fan press, and have appeared more in the comics, where actor availability isn't really an issue. Isn't the future beautiful? It is, thanks to you. One actor who I was happy to see is Judy Geeson as Ruth. We wouldn't want anything bad to happen to your baby, now would we? A veteran British actress since the 60s, I actually knew her best for a very specific thing. 
When I was first learning all about the golden age of Hollywood, and specifically Joan Crawford, Mommy Dearest properly got my attention when I read that she spent the last decade of her career starring in various horror films from Whatever Happened to Baby Jane onward, and I became unusually obsessed with a British one from 1967 called Berserk, set in a circus where the performers keep dying during the acts and she keeps the tour going because suddenly ticket sales are on the up, which puts her under suspicion of murdering people to drum up good business. Judy Geeson plays her daughter Angela, who, spoilers, turns out to be the killer, and so effective as one that she can magically appear out of nowhere and be in several locations at once. I haven't rewatched it in years, but I remember loving it as a kid, so maybe it's G1. But anyway, there's a weird connection and recommendation for you. The house is guarded by men and magic. Charlotte's not going anywhere. Ruth as a character is unique in that she's a human existing in a time where power was tied to land owning and social status more than ever, making her a formidable enemy for Ava and her coven. And since the Charmed Ones lose their powers when travelling back to before their line even existed, to them as well. Hang them! Hang them all! She's able to supplement her power with knowledge of tarot reading, and using talismans to tap into the inherent power of All Hallows Eve, with a little help from Cole. So while she doesn't have anything in the way of active powers, her status allows her to be a match for the sisters, who have to outwit her and play her game to save the day. They think we're dead now. They certainly aren't expecting us. The fighting is not done with incantations, vanquishing potions or active powers, but to use Prue's words... Knowledge and reverence. Knowledge and reverence. The show obviously began as an attempt to be somewhat accurate to Wicca and neo-pagan practices, before season 2 shifted things, so I like that this episode incorporates the show's roots to subtly comment on the evolution and make it feel as though it's magic itself that has evolved since the 1600s, giving the impression that the changes to emphasise the action and vanquishing potions is more like the Halliwells just making the world their own after what they inherited. And this magic? This knowledge is forgotten? We could get it back if you teach us. For the most part, everything Ava goes on about here has a basis in real magic. It's not just a doll, it's a totem. Poppets made from corn husks to protect and heal, using a broom to sweep away negative energy, a conical hat focusing power and drawing it down, apples are used in wishing spells, laurel is used for cleansing, banishing and healing, and lavender is likewise used for healing and attraction. Put it all together, it may just work. Aside from this, there's also more obvious commentary on how the role of the witch has changed with Phoebe beginning the episode annoyed about all the stereotypes associated with the classic image of the Wicked Witch. Hook nose hags riding broomsticks, that's what we're celebrating. While the 20th century had seen a rehabilitation of the witch somewhat, with more benign contemporary figures like Samantha Stevens, the 90s zeitgeist did still perceive witchcraft as something evil or dangerously alien, since the only reason the craft got slapped with an R rating was because it featured teenagers dabbling in it. So it's perfectly reasonable that Phoebe would see such a caricature and be like, hey, my ancestors got killed just because of their beliefs and you mock them like this? Not cool, folks. But throughout the journey, and getting properly in touch with her roots, and where her powers come from, she learns to be a little less Tumblr girl, and finds herself in a situation where... I'm going to embrace the cliché. Come on, I think we all agree that, dated blue screen effects aside, this is just the best moment. <laughs> And hey, Phoebe is canonically the one sister who's easily swayed to evil, so do we call this foreshadowing? <laughs> I've also come to notice that this kind of flashback to the 17th century was somehow more of a thing in the 90s than it is today, especially with the witch media we got. Hocus Pocus has a prologue in 1693, and in Salem too. Sabrina the Teenage Witch had a whole episode involving recreating the Salem witch trials for a weekend. Me? A witch? That's ridiculous! The Fear Street books have the shady side curse stemming from an incident that also happened in Salem. And outside of the genre stuff, we also got our only Hollywood adaptation of The Crucible in 1996. It's fun to think about how this stuff was just in the zeitgeist more at the time, fell out of fashion and is starting to come back thanks to the 20 and 30 year cycles, what with period horror like The Witch, the third Fear Street film taking place in 1666, as well as Wednesday incorporating this setting into its lore, and indeed a Hocus Pocus sequel again featuring a scene in this time. So you can put yourself in the mind of a charmed writer who needed an idea for a Halloween episode, and would immediately think of time travel back to the 17th century for this reason. Witches must not have to hide in your time. In terms of historical accuracy, 
Okay, even though it's a bit of a myth that everyone in olden times was always super covered up, see this 1623 painting, Puritans would not be showing that much skin, and Phoebe going sleeveless. Well, you have to keep that sweltering October heat at bay. But here's some historical accuracy that's especially fun because it's correcting a previous mistake. Hang witch. Melinda Warren was said to have been burnt at the stake in the Salem witch trials. However, despite popular misconceptions, no witch was actually burned at Salem. Witches weren't even burned in America, and that was more of a European thing. As shown in the Crucible, the accused either confessed and were merely held for questioning, released when the hunt was over, or else died by hanging. When the sisters are outed as witches, they're set up to be hung, and then saved by a red shirt called Micah who serves as a one episode love interest for Prue. Thank you. Another time. And speaking of love interests, this is actually a key episode in Cole's arc. Firstly because it shows him making a direct attempt on the sisters' lives beyond just trying to steal the Book of Shadows. Trying to eliminate them by not necessarily killing Charlotte and or Melinda, but just making sure Melinda is raised by evil. That alternate future would be fun to explore, but let's not get sidetracked. Then let me go. Although unquestionably an evil act, it kind of blurs the lines compared to past antagonists, where he's trying to come up with an indirect way to stop the sisters, and even nopes it out of the mission when he sees that they've won, and seems to respect them for it. Gotta give him credit. Which also happens after... The name of your true love begins with a C. How can you not love this moment? Cool. The, oh help, she actually loves me and I'm lying to her and messing her around and what's this? I actually feel bad? What is this thing I'm feeling? Phoebe's catching feelings super quickly for a man she's not been on an official date with yet though. The ADA? You're dating him? Uh, n no. The B-plot of the episode is also a good one, incorporating Daryl and Leo into the action in a nice way, and highlighting just what heights of quality the writing had gotten to by season 3 that the secondary storylines enhance the episodes as well. I gotta figure out a way to get rid of these demons before the girls return, otherwise they're gonna be sitting ducks. I'll go into more detail when I get around to my Leo video, but even though I hold season 4 up as when this character transcended being Piper's man candy, season 3 did make some attempts to develop him as well. And here we have him take over vanquishing duty while the sisters are MIA. Which means- Which means you're gonna need my help. Daryl also gets to fight demons and establish his badass normal credentials. <laughs> it's also where he finds out Leo is a white lighter, since in the Charmed universe these things are a sort of learn-as-you-go deal. Who are you? Uh... And sweet Jesus, are these scenes slashy or what? I only recently found out the popularity of Prue and Daryl as a ship. But here's an episode giving Leo and Daryl plenty of material. Happy Halloween. Oh, and the Grimlocks from Out of Sight are back, albeit played by different actors, one of whom is Michael Bailey Smith, who also plays Balthazor in demon form. I haven't covered Out of Sight in too much detail yet, but I have to say that the Grimlocks are some of my favourite demons in the show. Obviously being out of the sewers for this episode takes away a little of their original menace, but I love this moment of Daryl getting within range of their powers. <laughs> <laughs> and when the sisters return to the present, they're vanquished in the same way as before. Hey, haven't I vanquished you somewhere before? I ain't a Prue fan, but you have to love this moment. Prue actually gets quite a few good moments throughout, such as this famous line. I'm Micah. I'm charmed. And that, coupled with her getting the best costume, means she's kind of the star of this episode. Who was that masked man? And so... Charmed had its only Halloween episode on the first All Halliwell's Eve of the New Millennium, and it did not disappoint. Halloween is now officially my favourite holiday. It seems to be pretty beloved, considering the amount of requests I got to cover it, and my love for it is eternal too. You felt the power. And I can only sigh at the fact that we never had another proper episode celebrating the holiday again. Like, seriously guys, we had Robert Englund and Bruce Campbell guest starring in season 4, and a new cast member best known for her role in one of the biggest horror films of the decade. You didn't want to capitalise on that? A Night to Remember could have been a Halloween episode, so could Happily Ever After, and I suppose The Legend of Sleepy Halliwell. Could have made Charm Noir a two-parter and had the second part involve a pulp horror novel, just saying. But back to seriousness. I'm so impressed that you can make a protest statement and show cleavage all at the same time. 
Thanks. Amazing. It's clear that whenever you watch season three, the show had reached a peak in terms of embarking on long-term arc-based storytelling and still delivering standalone episodes that were just very fun. Whoa. Did you see that? I recently did a video on season two and how bland I found most of its episodes, but also how the good ones in the season are great. And I feel like season three sought out to make every episode on a level of morality bites will pardon my past. And I don't just mean because all three of these have time travel, although that does seem to be a necessary ingredient for making a charmed episode fun, but good writing, good direction, and good acting always take priority above all else. As well as letting Holly Marie Combs do plenty of snarking. You've made a big clock so small, you must possess great magic. Just a good credit card. And as the best holiday of the year approaches us, let's all strive to have as much fun as Alyssa Milano is clearly having in this scene. Mm -hmm.